Boys and girls, come on up front here for a short pastor's pals before you go back to Children's Church. Okay. Okay, how, how many of you know what, what holiday just went by? What, what real big holiday? Christmas, Christmas yeah. Now, I know there was New Year's too, but Christmas is the one that you probably remember most, right? Well, yeah, that's pretty good, getting strong. Okay, how many of you know what, what one of the things the Bible tells us that Jesus did when he was a kid? Now, we don't know a whole lot about his childhood, but it does tell us something about what Jesus did when he was still a boy. He obeyed his parents, that's true. That's very important, isn't it? Very important. But what else? Listen to his teachers. Probably could assume that. This is something that the Bible actually talks about, though, when he was 12 years old. When he was 12, do you know? He told some of the wise people about Okay. He went to the synagogue with his parents, okay, like going to church today. And he learned about God while he was there. In fact, it tells us that when he was there, um, that he, he talked with the, the rabbis and the teachers of the law, and they were amazed at him. And it says uh, <coughs> that he uh, stayed behind when his mom and dad were there because it was the feast time. And then when they left Jerusalem, they actually forgot that Jesus was with, wasn't with them. And they had to go back and look for him. And they found him back in the temple, uh, sitting there, talking with the, the ministers. We'll say ministers, the rabbis, the teachers of the law. Now, do you know what he told his parents when they said, hey, where were you? Now, how come you weren't with us? We walked a day's journey this way, and then we had to walk a day journey back. So for two days, he was there in Jerusalem by himself, 12-year-old boy apparently doing well. Um, but what did he tell his parents when they came and said, why weren't you with us? What have you been doing? Do you, do you know what he said, told them? He said, don't you know I have to be busy about my father's business? Now, who was Jesus's father? Who was his father? Joseph. Mm, Joseph was his stepfather. Yeah, that gets a little tricky, doesn't it? <laughs> Joseph wasn't his his. Uh, biological father. Joseph was just his stepfather. Who was his real father? Who was his real father? God. And, I don't know. <laughs> so he said, I have to be busy about my father's business. That means he said, I have to be busy about doing God's business. This is a 12-year-old. This is a 12-year-old. If that was today, Jesus would be in church. And he would be staying in church for Sunday school and children's church and church and, and maybe even after all that, even when his parents were ready to leave and go to Sonny's for lunch, <laughs> Jesus would probably be staying behind, well, if he could, talking to the ministers, talking to the Sunday school teachers, talking to people about the Bible. He loved being about his father's business. And I want to challenge you to be like Jesus. To, to love going to church, to love learning about the Bible, to, to, to enjoy it and to desire to do it and to realize it's what we're supposed to do. It's our responsibility. Yes? Um, it's hard to be like Jesus. Yes, it is hard to be because like Jesus. Everyone sins. That's true. Everyone, we sin. And, and one of the sins we do is we, we want to stay home and sleep in instead of going to church. Or we want to stay home and watch cartoons instead of going to church. Right, only Jesus is perfect. But we're supposed to imitate Jesus. We're supposed to try to be like him. Yes. So, that, uh, when, when Sunday morning rolls around, ask your parents, say, are we going to church today? Are we going? And if they're still sleeping, wake them up. I don't know, wake and say, them up. No, 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 no. But you've got to be nice when you do that. Okay, yeah, you don't want to wake up. <laughs> what happens when you wake up? No. <laughs> got to be nice because you do have to honor your mother and father, but... You could, you could always say, can I please, yes, that's one of the Ten Commandments, say, can I please go to church? I want to go to church because I want to gather together with God's people, and I want to be busy about my father's business, right? About God's business. That's what our preoccupation ought to be. That's what we ought to be, be wanting to do, doing God's business. One more comment, yes. Um, God sees everything we do if we do something good or bad. 
That's right, he does. And he takes note of those things too, doesn't he? Okay, so can you, can you be busy about your father's business? About God's business? Yes, you can. <laughs> yes. By learning about him. By learning about him and then seeking to live what you learn. Okay? So with that, we're going to pray. And then I'm going to give you a treat. But you can't eat the treat during children's church. These are left over from Christmas. I got to get rid of them before the ants get to them. Okay? So you can take it to children's church, but don't eat it until after church. Don't eat it until after church. No, you don't have to have one. Let's pray. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. I thank you for these children. And I pray that you would help them to be like Jesus when he was a boy, that they would desire to learn more and more and more and more about you and then seek to do what they learn. Help their parents to be like Jesus' parents who took him to the temple in the first place. Help us as moms and dads and as adults to set the pace, uh, to show our children that we love being about our father's business. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, grab one of these, take it to Children's Church, but don't eat it till later, right? Okay. Yeah, big package. Oh, M&M's went first. I got M&M's too. Okay, you want one? You can take one even if you don't want one and try to sell it to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you can share it with your mom and dad that's a good idea okay you can follow follow pastor sean over there Phew. <laughs> and i only have them for five minutes <laughs> I thank the Lord for people who work with children. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank you again for your continued prayers, for praying for my wife, but also for several other people. Uh, many of you have been praying for Fran Ingersoll, and if you haven't heard yet, uh, she is home. She was in the hospital this past week. She's been diagnosed with viral meningitis and, um, at, and also caught apparently a, a, a cold or whatever this flu bug is that's been going around while she was in the hospital. So continue to pray for her. Also pray for Sylvia Barnes. Sylvia was in the hospital for quite a while and uh, several days, I think almost a week. And uh, she went home though. She's doing better. She's at home now, but continue to pray for her. But there's a whole lot of people that come to church here that are sick. I think a whole lot of people nationwide <laughs> that are sick from this cold bug, flu bug, whatever it is that's going around. Um, uh, but be in, be in prayer for people. My mom's sick with it right now. I know I've had it. My, my daughter's had it. Her husband's had it. It seems like just about everybody uh, has had it. So um, has had the illness, not has had it. <laughs> I've had it. <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, has had the illness. So. Anyways, well, this morning I would like to uh, start off with a, a New Year's type of topic to follow up on what uh, Dave did last week. Uh, with his topic, this will tie into that a little bit, and uh, then we'll proceed through the month of, of January with topics related to the new year. I want to encourage you to come back tonight, uh, be in prayer for us as elders. This uh, coming this coming weekend, we'll be traveling uh, to a, a place where we're going to spend uh, some time together as elders, praying, uh, reading the Bible, and making plans uh, for the future year, discussing the ministries of the church and brainstorming and and planning and, and we need your prayers in relationship to that we'd also like a little bit of your input so tonight tonight our, our service is going to be in the adult conference center at the end of this hallway it'll be a, a little bit more informal we'll have devotions and then I would like uh, for you to give any input that you would like to give in relationship to the church and its ministries uh, so it's your chance to share with us and uh, then we'll, I'll take that information uh, with me uh, to this weekend's retreat and so I encourage you to come back this evening. But right now, I'd like to look at Ephesians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to concentrate on verses 8 through 17. I'd like to begin by reading those verses. Again, that's Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 17. The Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this 
For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is a shameful for it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, we we ask for your Holy Spirit's illumination. We've seen here that Christ is light and that he gives light to us, and we become the children of light. And so we, first of all, need your light, the light of your revelation in relationship to your word. So help us to understand it this morning. Help us to apply it to our lives. Help us to realize what areas of our life may not be pleasing to you, that we might live lives that are pleasing to you. Help our our hearts to be open. Help our minds to be receptive. Help us uh, to have tender spirits. Help us not to resist the truth or to be distracted from hearing it, but help us to pay careful attention to it. Father, we we need your help in becoming Christ-like, and so we ask for it this morning. We pray that this time would be pleasing to you as we seek to study your word together as your body. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There have been a lot of significant things that have happened over this past year. Uh, you've probably seen several of them in the news. Uh, one, one of which uh, is, has to do with a, a new crown prince in Saudi Arabia who has pledged to change the country, to modernize the country, uh, which would be, I think, a really, really great thing for Saudi Arabia. Um, you may not be aware of it, but uh, he has said that he's even going to give certain rights to women in that country. Um, which, while well, uh, we may be thinking, what's the big deal about that? Realize in a lot of Muslim-dominated, Islamic-dominated countries, women don't always enjoy the rights that they enjoy in the Western world. And so one of the rights he talked about was giving women the right to drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there goes the accident rate. No, no. <laughs> Just joking, just joking. I'm the one who backed into a pole out here behind the church and bent my <laughs> so, But yeah, when you hear that though, it's sort of odd, isn't it? Because we take that so much for granted. What do you mean, give women the right to drive? It's like they all have, we, that's, that's uh, the influence of Christianity on our culture where we, we see men and women as being equal. Uh, but in Islam, it's not that way. And if you, if you study the history of Islamic-dominated countries, you will see that women do not enjoy the same uh, status that men enjoy, even to this day in many of those countries. So uh, maybe this will be a good thing, uh, especially, again, uh, for the women of that country. We also saw uh, North Korea conducting multiple uh, nuclear tests, right, over the past year. In fact, in September... Um, the United States authorized the installation of the THAAD anti-missile system in South Korea. And, and um, we, get, we got a lot of flack from China because China is worried that we may use this uh, in relationship to them. Uh, it, and what it's supposed to be able to do is actually intercept this sort of a anti-ballistic missile intercept system. So that if North Korea does launch some missiles, because a few months after, after September... Uh, they, they launched a ballistic missile that shows, at least our intelligence agencies, believes that they have the capability of, of reaching any U.S. target now with a nuclear warhead. This is North Korea, and if, if you've been following North Korea at all, you realize that they're, um, they're, they're uh, what would you say, huh? <laughs> uh, we have a good reason, I think, to be fearful that they might do something that rational people might otherwise not do. And, um, and so we're, we're installing this system. I, I don't know how much of it has. I know they've already started on it, uh, whether it's completed or not. Uh, but it could also help protect us from any uh, nuclear missile launch from that region of the world. And so that's a big deal. And it's a big deal because China's not real happy about it. Also, 
not only did we see a, a new crown prince in Saudi Arabia and this uh, an anti-ballistic missile system being installed, but we also saw uh, the Rohingya crisis in Miramar, uh, where 400,000 plus refugees fled uh, from the persecution there that were um, pr predominantly the people who were persecuting them were Buddhist. And the people being persecuted were Muslim. So the tables turned a little bit because what we see in the Middle East for the most part is we see Muslims persecuting other religious groups, including Christians. In fact, I heard on uh, Moody Radio the other day, and if you don't um, listen to Christian radio, let me encourage 91.1 or 91.5. Uh, Moody has excellent teaching, excellent teachers. Um, you, can, you can get a lot of good, solid biblical truth on the Moody radio station. And, and then the Joy FM has, has um, some good teachers on there as well. A little, little more music. I think the Joy FM has a little more music, a less, little less teaching. And uh, Moody has a little more teaching, a little less music. They're both great stations. I'd encourage you to listen to them and be encouraged uh, by them. But I heard that I think it was um, Iraq or Iran. Iran is in danger of having almost a, a, a zero Christian population. Um, many of these Middle Eastern countries, as ISIS continues to, uh, and not just ISIS, but other terrorist groups continue to persecute Christians. Many of them flee. Some are being killed, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so the, the tables sort of turn in relationship to Miramar. Um, I'm not saying that's a good thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a bad thing no matter how you look at it. All of these things, are, uh, any type of persecution um, is a bad thing. Uh, we also uh, saw uh, the economy uh, doing well this past year. In fact, many of you have portfolios that are, that are looking up, right? M many of you probably, if you have any money in the stock market, have noticed increases in the value of your portfolio. Um, this is despite all of the worry during the election. Remember, whenever well, Trump gets elected, everything's going to fall to pieces. That's what we were being told. Um, he's been elected. Actually, things are doing very well, I think. There's a lot of criticism going on, a lot of division in our country, a lot of unrest, but economically, things are, are going pretty good. And uh, th then there, there's other things, different, different events that have transpired during this past year. But none of them are more significant than what can happen in the life of an individual if we do what Ephesians chapter 5 tells us to do. And again, I'd like to go back and reread the first part of that. Verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Can you imagine how living as children of light would change our lives? Would change the lives of our churches? Would change the lives, uh, uh, the life of our culture? would change maybe even the world if all believers everywhere lived as children of light. If they did not engage in the unfruitful works of darkness but lived as children of light. If they not only lived that way but spoke the truth, the, the way that we're supposed to speak the truth, how much would that impact our families? How much would that impact our churches? How much would that impact our culture? I think that America enjoys the blessings that it enjoys in large part due to its Christian heritage and um, the pr principles that the early Christians helped to ingrain into our culture, into the mindset of American people. Even something as simple as the Puritan work ethic, where the, the Puritans believed that work was a gift from God, the ability to work. Now, I know uh, hard work is a result of the curse. <laughs> and some of you, some of you are saying, that's right, Pastor, don't forget that. <laughs> And a lot of people don't like to work hard, but the, the, the ability to work was seen as a gift from God, and the ability to do the best that one can do at his work was seen as a God-given responsibility. You didn't go to work to see how little you could do and how big of a paycheck you could collect in doing so little. And that's what most people want to do today, right? How, what, what job is the easiest kind of job that pays the most? That's what a lot of people want. Uh, but the Puritans... And, and that Puritan work ethic had the, had the idea that when I go to work, I'm to do the very best that I can. I'm to work as hard as I can and to do as good a job as I can and produce a, the best product that I can produce. Because it was seen as, as being a way of glorifying God, that through the way I work, I could bring glory to God. And I, I think that's a part of living as children of light. 
Just think, even if just that work ethic returned to the American mindset, but not just the American mindset, to the world. And, and then uh, ideas on morality and, and on and on and on. Think of what the world would be like if we simply did what verse 8 says and lived as children of light. Christ, Christ desires that we live that way, that we live as children of light because that's who we are now. We are light in the Lord. Uh, we are part of God's family now. We've been adopted into his family by faith in Jesus Christ. Or at least I hope you have been. If you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, that's how you become a part of the family of God. We're not born into the family of God by natural birth. You are not a son or daughter of God simply because you exist as a human being. There are a lot of people that think we are. And there are some churches that teach that. I've sat under the preaching of people who have addressed everybody there. Uh, well, we're all the children of God. No, we're all creations of God. We're not all the children of God. John chapter 1, verse 12 says this, But as many as received him, but as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God, or the sons of God is what it actually says. To them who believe on his name. Who's a child of God? The person who believes in Jesus Christ. Who belongs to God's family? The person who believes in Jesus Christ. And when we become a child of God, we receive a new nature. We receive an illuminated mind, a mind that is now capable of understanding the Scriptures, which prior to faith in Christ wasn't. Paul says to the church at Corinth that the unsaved man, the natural man, as he uses that word natural, the unsaved man, the natural man understandeth not the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. The only way you can understand Scripture is if the Holy Spirit of God indwells you because then the Holy Spirit of God, who is the author of God's Word, illuminates your mind to the truth of God's Word and you can understand it. But not only can you understand it, you can apply it. You can live it out in your life. And that's what the encouragement here to the church at Ephesus was. Once we were darkness, once we were outside of the grace of God, once we were outside of the family of God, once we did not understand the things of God, and you hear that all the time. Actually, sometimes you hear, you hear the saved who, who aren't in the Word uh, asking questions about why certain things happen because they don't understand the Word of God. Why would God allow this? And why would God do that? And why did this happen? And, and I'm mad at God because He allowed this. And a lot of that is simply because they don't understand the plans and purposes of God. And so we were once in darkness. Our minds were alienated from the grace of God and, and from the illumination of the Spirit of God. But once we come to Christ, now we're light in the Lord. And light speaks of illumination. Now light speaks of of truth. In the Bible, light oftentimes represents either God or truth or illumination. And all of those things become true for the believer. We belong to God. We know the truth of God through the Word of God, and, and our minds have become illumined to it and to the things of the Lord. And so we're to live that way. Live that way because that's who you are. Live out who you are in Christ. Live as children of light. Now, he doesn't say it here, but I think it's implied later on when he, when he talks about the evil days, and certainly it's implied in other scriptures that there's another reason to live this way, and that's simply because time is short. Time is short for us as human beings, and it's running out for many of us. We're getting closer and closer to that day when we're going to be called home to glory, right? My mom and I were having this conversation just the other day. I took her to a doctor's appointment. My mom has a wonderful attitude about things. And uh, she, as many of you know, she was hospitalized over the uh, Thanksgiving holidays. Her heart was in AFib. She's 80 years old. But she, we were, we're coming back. There's 13 kids in my mom's family. 13 kids and a mom and dad, so 15 all together. And my mom would say, you know, I think I'm fortunate. She's 80 years old now. She says, I think I'm fortunate. And I said, why, that, why are you saying that, Mom? She says, because, you know, I outlived both of my parents. Both of my grandparents on my mom's side died at 64. They both died at 64. She says, and I've outlived all of my brothers and sisters except for two. And she says, I'm ready, I'm ready to go. Whenever the Lord calls me home, I'm ready to go. I've been very fortunate in life. But, you know, when she was 10, 80 seemed like <laughs> a millennia away. 
like a long ways away. If you're 18, uh, you know, when I was 18, I thought 40 was old. I thought that I'd be lucky if I ever reached the age of 40. Of course, the, you know, I was living sort of a wild life too. <laughs> but I thought, man, if I make it to 40, whew, now that I'm 60, 40 seems young, right? And, uh, and, and the older we get, the, the younger it seems. But, but, but we realize, too, the older we get, the more we realize life is short. It passes us by quickly, doesn't it? It was only yesterday, it seems like, that I graduated from high school, that I graduated from college, that my kids were born. It just, it, it, you can see it clearly in your mind's eye. But the older we get, the more we realize life goes by quickly and time is short. And, and that ties into this passage, even though it's not mentioned in this passage, I think by the fact that he says then to, that we're to make the most of every opportunity. If you look at verse 15, he says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Now he says there, because the days are evil. And we do live in an evil generation, and the only cure to an evil generation is the gospel of Christ. Education hasn't changed our culture for the better. You realize in America we have some of the most educated people in the world. I know there's other, there's other countries. There's other um, countries where they have uh, higher even educational standards than America. But if you look at our country as a whole, we're a very literate nation. We have a lot of people that not only have high school um, diplomas, but have college diplomas and advanced degrees beyond that, masters and doctors degrees. Uh, we're a very literate, very educated culture. But is this world a safer and better place to live? Are people more honest? Now everything has to be in contract form, doesn't it? No longer do you just shake hands with somebody over something and believe that they'll fulfill the responsibilities. Now you have to have it in writing. And every time you turn around, somebody's threatening to sue somebody over something. It's, and if it's not that, it's crime and drugs and, and dishonesty and immorality. Even our government, what's been happening lately as we, we look at all, all, all of these politicians now that, where women are coming forward and saying, hey, this happened to me by this person. Respected people, high-ranking people, uh, some of the very same people who used to criticize the clergy, when all of these things were happening with certain clergy people. And you look at that, it, 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 those are groups of people where it should never happen, especially clergy, but also with, with politicians, people who have been trusted with authority and with power and with privilege. And, and, and so we're to live as children of, of light, even, even in an evil age, because it's an evil age, because it's the hope of an evil age, and because time is short. Christ desires that we live lives to please him, and that ought to be our primary goal in life, living lives to please him. And when we live lives to please him, one of the things that you'll note, if we go back and look at this again, <clears throat> in verse 8 it says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. But rather expose them. A part of living as children of lives has to do not only with our lifestyle and not engaging in what the Bible here calls fruitless deeds of darkness. In other words, there's no benefit to them. There may be some sort of temporary benefit, but there's no long-lasting benefit. There's especially no benefit in the sight of God. But it also goes on to say that we're to expose those fruitless deeds of darkness. And a part of living as light, since our minds have been illuminated to the truth of God, we illuminate our culture to the truth of God as well. And a part of that is taking a stand for morality taking a stand even on those controversial issues that God's Word says something about. And you know what I'm talking about. There are a lot of issues today that the world and the church are in conflict over. Uh, sexual issues, right? For example, premarital sex. I, I remember, and this was several years ago now, back in the late 1990s, I took a class. Uh, uh, it was a Moody grad class, and it was on leadership and we had a pastor there of a church in Tampa, and it, they were talking about church discipline. Maybe, I think maybe I've shared this before. They were talking about church discipline, 
and they were talking about uh, Corinthians and how there was a man that had his uh, father's mother and how Paul says, you know, you should uh, that disfellowship that type of person, etc. So we're going over the process of church discipline, and this guy apparently had never studied that before. I don't know how he got to be a pastor, but he raised his hand and he says, you mean we're supposed to do this with anybody that's living in moral lives? And the, the teacher, the professor said, well, anybody who's a Christian... Right? The Bible distinguishes that. Anybody who calls himself a believer is supposed to live by the standards that Christ has given to us. So anyone who's a believer. And he said, well, if I did that, I wouldn't have a church. What a sad commentary on the state of the church today. Not only, not only are we not living as children of light, but many people today are engaging in the fruitless deeds of darkness rather than exposing them. They're engaging in them. And so immorality is rampant in the church. And it's not just with young people, it's with older people. I, I, I was amazed. We, I had a lady tell me the other day, I didn't realize it, I, I've known her and her husband casually for a number of years, and I was talking to her in the parking lot, and I asked her how her husband was, and he says, oh, you didn't hear? He left me six months ago. The man's in his early 60s. He's older than I am. He's been married for 30-some years. And he left his wife for another lady. We're not, it's not just young people. It's older people as well. It's, it's everybody. Christian couple. This is a Christian couple. And, and so it happens. And, and yet it's not supposed to happen. We're, rather than engaging in the fruitless deeds of darkness, we're supposed to expose them. Whether, whether it's popular or not to expose them. Whether whether we're thought favorably of or whether we're not thought favorably of. And I can guarantee you, you probably won't be thought favorably of. And the more at odds the church becomes with the culture that exists around the church, the more unpopular the church will become, unless the church acquiesces to the standards of the world. Unless we don't say anything about the fruitless deeds. Unless we decide not to expose them. We'll just be quiet about that. You know, there's a lot of people here living with their boyfriend or girlfriend. There's a lot of people here having extramarital affairs. There's a lot of people here that are engaged in, in deviant forms of sexual behavior. There are a lot of people here, and I'm not saying grace, okay? <laughs> and, the, and the church can say, you know, so let's not talk about that. Let's just talk about positive things. Let's just concentrate on the positive. And it's good to be positive. But at the same time, we have to expose sin for what sin is. And the Bible here, in this passage, tells us we're supposed to do that. Again, verse 11. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is a shame. Verse 12. This gives you an idea. I think, I think that he has in mind that this, these fruitless deeds of darkness certainly probably include uh, deviant sexual behaviors, uh, sexual behaviors that are not condoned by the Bible, but condemned by the Bible, because verse 12 says, for it is a shame even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. And so it's part of the job of the church, of believers, of believers to expose the fruitless deeds of darkness. But I can guarantee you, the more you do that, the more you do that, the more the world will be at odds with you. The more the world will be at odds with the church. And, and it's coming. It's already here, but it's going to get worse. Yet we're still, still, we're still encouraged to live as children of light. We're still encouraged to seek to please the Lord in everything that we do. Verse 13, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. And so we're to take every opportunity that we can to share Christ, to illuminate the world to the one who has illuminated us. Christ shined on us. We came to faith in Jesus Christ. The love of God shone in our heart. We understood what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us, dying for our sins so that we could have eternal life by faith in him and it is our desire then to shine on the world the grace of God through Jesus Christ and that's what we're encouraged to do and we're encouraged in the process to be wise about it not unwise making the most of every opportunity and so I want to encourage you as part of this new year 
to make the most of every opportunity to share Christ. You can do that in planned fashion and in unplanned fashion. What do I mean by that? Unplanned are, are those opportunities that come your way to share Jesus with somebody that you didn't plan on. Somebody knocks on the door, you open the door, it turns out to be the cable installer, and he comes in, and in the process you start talking and maybe have time to share Christ with that person. The Bible says, make the most of every opportunity. Maybe, you're, maybe you go to the same restaurant every, every week, like some of us do. <laughs> you know, every Monday and every Thursday, we go to the same restaurant. And there's a few of us uh, that have been doing that for years, and we've tried to share Christ through various ways with the waitresses there. Because that's what we're supposed to do, make the most of every opportunity. In fact, we've even, one of the waitresses at the restaurant we go to, her husband was dying of brain cancer, and and so we gave her some gifts, and the guys that go to breakfast there signed the card, and we gave it to her, trying to, trying to be light to this person. Uh, there's another young lady there, who, a hard worker, real pleasant personality, and I know she's going to school, and I've given her a church card, and if you've ever seen our church cards, uh, I have the gospel inside of this, so it does dual duty. It, it's a way of uh, helping them to know more about the church, but also it has the gospel inside of it where they can learn about salvation. And um, I know uh, Harry and some of the other guys, Todd and some of the others that go uh, to eat there have uh, all at one time or another mentioned things about the church or about Christ trying to be light to this person. And so on uh, uh, the, the last day that we went there for breakfast before Christmas, um, in trying to be light and, and taking, taking advantage. Now, this was something planned. This wasn't unplanned so much. Sometimes it's unplanned. This was planned. I, uh, I gave her a $10 tip for a $5.65 breakfast. And I did that because, as many of you know, when I was going through college, I worked at a restaurant where I oftentimes heard the waitresses complain about the Sunday lunch crowd. You know who the Sunday lunch crowd were? the Christians that ran out of church to the restaurant. And you know why they complained about them? They were the worst tippers. And I remember as a young person then deciding I did not want to be one of those people. Now, I hate tipping as much as the rest of you. Right? I, th I keep thinking, you're the employer ought to pay these people. But I realize how the system works and it helps, you know, anyways. Uh, so I, but there's something more important than money. There's something more important than money. And that is a person's salvation their eternal destiny. And if you can use your money to help somebody listen to the gospel, you ought to do it. Whether it's leaving a little bit bigger tip on Sundays, because they probably know you, oh, this guy's dressed up, he just got out of church. And, and, and maybe making a positive impact on him, or whether it's the, that unplanned occasion, maybe it's in your neighborhood. Planning to reach your neighbors. Uh, for Christ, making the most of every opportunity. I'm amazed at how many people don't know their neighbors. In fact, I'll, let me ask you. I asked the early, the early uh, service this as well. How many of you know the family that lives to the right of your house? If you're standing looking out your front door, how many of you know the family that lives to the right of your house? Okay. How many of you know the family that lives to the left of your house? How many of you know the family that lives across the street from your house, if you live in a subdivision? How many know the family that lives behind your house, if you have it? Okay, how many of you know how many of you know all four of your immediate neighbors? All four of your immediate neighbors. How many of you don't? Just being honest, how many of you don't? Quite a few hands. Can I suggest to you that there's the place to start? They're your neighbors. Go over and knock on their door and introduce yourself. You say, but I've lived here for 20 years and never talked to them. I'd be embarrassed to do that. Okay, let's go over and apologize. Say, hey, I'm sorry, I've never met you before. I should have. I'd like to introduce myself. I live right beside you. <laughs> Make sure your yard's clean before you do that. If your dog's not going to the bathroom in their yard. You know, those little things that can annoy a neighbor. But make the most of every opportunity. When, when Barb and I moved into our neighborhood, we had a goal of witnessing to every neighbor in our neighborhood. And we've tried to do that over the years. We've tried to do that in a variety of ways. In fact, this morning, I mentioned uh, there's a house that's been vacant. It's a rental. We, we're getting more and more rentals in our neighborhood. And uh, the family that was there, I had the opportunity to witness to them, share Christ with them. In fact, I married the two of them. They were living together. And it's interesting how when the pastor comes over, they, 
they, they make, you know, decisions to do things. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, Pastor, you know, we've been meaning to get married. And I said, well, what's stopping you? And they said, well, uh, the money. And I said, well, I'll do it for free. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I married him up at uh, Pine Island, out on the beach. Did the wedding up there. Uh, but in the process, uh, tried to share Christ. Well, they, they moved. They moved out of the house. The house has been vacant for a couple months now. And this morning I looked out, and there's this old beat-up pickup truck in the, in the driveway. And I looked at it, and I thought, oh, man, I hope these people don't trash the place. <laughs> you know, I've, unfortunately, judging judging the, the inhabitants by their, the vehicle that they're driving. I know you shouldn't do that. I know you shouldn't do that. Uh, but then I corrected myself. I thought, wait a second, it's Sunday morning. I ought to be concerned about this guy's soul. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, but the th- thought came to me real quick. You know, hey, that's not the way to think about this. There's a person that I need to witness to. And so hopefully, uh, over the next few days, I'll get to meet this person, and I'll make plans to do that and talk to them about Jesus. And all of us ought to be doing that. All of us ought to be doing that. Are you planning to reach your neighbors with the gospel of Christ? Or do you hide from them? And you say, well, but but you don't know my neighbors. They're evil. Hey, this is talking about an evil generation. And yet in the midst of the evil generation, it's saying make the most of every opportunity. You don't hide from evil. You engage it. And you engage it with the gospel. You don't run and and form a convent or a monastery somewhere and live up in the mountain away from everybody because it's safe and secure and you don't have to deal with the evil people around you. How are you going to impact them for Christ? We're never called to withdraw from the world. We're called to engage the world. And so how are are you doing that? Are, Are you doing it in a while? Are you making plans? Not as unwise, but as wise. Making Make it, look at the text, verse 16, making the most of every opportunity. Are you doing that? Are you, have you made plans to reach your neighbors? You say, well, how do I do that? Have a, have a barbecue. Invite one or two of them over, maybe three or four of them over, depending on how your finances are. Have a dessert night. Have a game night. Invite them over to play um, Monopoly or something. Monopoly takes too long. Play something else. Win, lose, or draw. You find out a lot of people <laughs> about, about... Anyways, and invite them over for game night. Uh, and invite them to go somewhere with you, to go out to eat. But are you making plans to make the most of every... Are you trying to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity in the process of living like children of light were to help others to see the light that Christ may shine on them that they might come to know the Savior as well sometimes things distract us from doing that sometimes busyness distracts us from doing that you know we have you ever heard people talk on leadership and they talk about the urgent versus the important and all these little things come up in our life that are urgent, that aren't maybe as important. What's more important? The eternal destiny of your neighbor or that your yard needs cutting that day? Right? Or that you had in your mind you were going to clean out the garage? I'd suggest that if you get the opportunity to talk to the neighbor or make plans to talk to them, that we ought to be more busy about that type of thing and not, not distracted by things that aren't as important but to make the most of every opportunity finally finally he goes on he says after he says making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil so we don't we don't withdraw from the evil age in which we live in we still seek to engage the culture in a wise manner not not participating in the unfruitful works of darkness but rather exposing them and then he goes on he says therefore do not be uh, foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. And I ended with that because a lot of people wonder, well, how do I know what the Lord's will is? Just read this book. We've just talked about what part of it is. Part of it is making the most of every opportunity. Then he goes on, he says, don't be drunk with wine. Then he talks about uh, submission to various people groups and various relations. And then he goes on and he goes on and he goes on. Here's the will of God. It's in this book. And so for this new year, let's start with the very first thing that we see in connection with that, making the most of every opportunity. And I'd like you to join me in resolving to do that. Say, well, Pastor Dean, I've already resolved to do that. Then recommitting ourselves to do it. 
Because I know if you're like me, I need to do that often. Sort of like New Year's resolutions, right? We talked about that. You make a resolution, I'm going to lose weight this year. You know how many years I've made that resolution? I don't even make it anymore because it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work because you've got to do something about it. And we can make resolutions to reach the lost, to reach our neighbors, to, to witness more, to talk to people about Jesus and make disciples. It's not just winning them to the Lord, it's discipling them. But unless we do something about it, it doesn't work. And so I want you to ask the Lord to help, help you to make it work, to shine on others with the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you join me in praying that as we prepare our hearts for communion? Father in heaven, as we get ready to take communion, it reminds